as uh, I was trying to cut her short, um, because when she just started talking about dead men walking, um, that comes from an episode uh, in my life when I came here in New York uh, after 9-1-1 with President Mandela. That's when uh, Robert De Niro had uh, galvanized uh, the guys in, in Hollywood to come and start Tribeca Film Festival here. Uh, now Tribeca is working. And that's how I met all these big shots. And Sean Penn was there. He had just made a movie called Dead Men Walking. Um, I had been kept in the death cells in South African jails. Um, the gallows, where they, they hang people. And so I said to him, why don't you make a movie uh, about me? Because I'm, I'm not walking. They said dead men walking when they would hang, but I'm talking, so <laughs> let's, let's have dead men talking. Uh, before you get me on the wrong side, I had not been in jail in the gallows because I had killed anybody. Maybe I should have. That could have shortened our stay in prison. Um, but it all ended up on a happy note. And I, I need to say that one of the things that kept us alive in prison on Roman Island for many, many years, Nelson Mandela for 27 years. I was there for 15 years, um, uh, which is a discount. Um, what kept us together was the power of sport. Uh, sport that united us uh, prisoner to prisoner because we came from different sides of the political divide uh, in South Africa. Uh, and it united also prisoner and jailer uh, because all of us were black as a male and all the, j the jailers were, were white and male. Uh, we started as adversaries, people who could not see eye to eye because we're divided in South Africa, so we're more divided in prison. But they, 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 they were the detractors, they were keeping us away from um, mixing. Uh, prisoner to prisoner. We're kept in different sections, section A, B, C, D, and so on, eight sections. And uh, yeah, the challenge was to use sport, all kinds of sports, as a catalyst for change, a catalyst for making friends, a catalyst for, for crossing the divide, the prisoner prisoner divide and the black and white uh, divide. Um, so much so that through sport and reconciliation in prison, uh, Nelson Mandela, at his inauguration, when he became the first president of uh, a democratic South Africa, he had invited two warders, two prison officials, to stand behind him um, to show that we had gone a long way. But also, um, Nelson Mandela became doubly involved in, in galvanizing South Africans and the world at large uh, behind, behind many sporting codes, uh, the cricket, uh, which we hosted, World Cricket, the Rugby World Cup, which we also hosted and won. We just lost uh, the other day <laughs> to, to these all blacks. Uh, they regard us in South Africa as all whites, so they beat us. Uh, <laughs> And, and, and of course, the creme de la creme of sport, which is the FIFA World Cup. Uh, for Nelson Mandela to try to get it in 2006 and lost it to Germany. By one vote, I see that there's an investigation now to find out how South Africa lost the World Cup 2006 with one vote. We don't know what happened there. Uh, but in any case, when we got a chance uh, to host it in 2010, we did a good job, held a world class, first class, World Cup, uh, that has been better than most of the World Cups. Mohammed, thanks, I'm here today at your invitation. And uh, I've just arrived, sir. Um, so if I don't sound very coherent, it's because I've been sitting on, in the plane flying direct from Johannesburg uh, to, to New York. We landed only a, a couple of hours ago. And straight from the airport, I thought we'd go to the airport uh, to 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 wash myself down. So if you hear any stench, it's me, okay? <laughs> Just say, is the prisoner in the house? It's okay. 
So straight from there, I thought we'd get to the airport. They say Crown Plaza and then Council of Foreign Relations. Here we are. So I haven't organized my thoughts very, very carefully uh, in this regard. So I've got some notes here, which I made, and I'm going to make some references to them. But I came to honor your invitation uh, as a friend. I've been to your house. Thanks for, for the lunch that we had the other day with some of the friends. And uh, on this subject of uh, the International Center for uh, Sport, uh, Security in Sport, I wish to point out that, uh, you know, basically, there are three things that we do as human beings. I came to, to learn that because I'm one of the human beings in life. Uh, it is the reproduction of the species. See, the Chinese have let loose now. Um, and it is research and uh, production of goods and services in the economy. That's the second thing that we do as human beings. And the third thing is to relax. And the biggest portion of relaxing, relaxation and leisure is sport. That's the biggest thing that we ever do. So we make ourselves up in reproduction, we produce in the economy and when, at the end of the day, we relax. Sport has become an ever more, most important thing in the lives of people because when we tire, we want to relax, we want to laze, um, we want to participate in it or spectate. Nelson Mandela has got, I don't know if it was quoted here, if it was, I'm going to say it here. He's got an evergreen message that I always refer to when I speak about sport. A message which he gave at one stage to leaders of sport who had assembled elsewhere on the power of this thing called sport. For me as an icon, somebody who comes from my own country, but one of the most emblematic of leaders in the world, I always refer, there are so many things about Nelson Mandela. Uh, we have got his quotations, about 3,000 quotations of Nelson Mandela summarized in a booklet uh, printed by the Nelson Mandela Foundation of which I'm director, uh, I played a very strong role in making sure that those things are quoted appropriately. But this one I like the most, because away from his quotations about war, uh, guerrilla warfare, uh, death, broken marriages, those type of things, he has the, the following to say about sport. Sport has the power to change the world. It has the power to inspire. It has the power to unite people in a way that little else does. It speaks to youth in a language they understand. Sport can create hope where once there was only despair. It is more powerful, I like this one, more powerful than government in breaking down racial barriers. It laughs in the face of all types of discrimination. This conference, Mohammed, is appropriate to defend this evergreen statement. This is Mandela vintage. Not Mandela talking about history of mankind, philosophy, politics, but this is Mandela recognizing finally what human beings want to do. Sport is about happiness, about joy, it's about excitement. It's about play. You know, we think that only children play. We want to play sport, whether it is table tennis, you want to play it. You want to play tennis. You want to play in the swimming pool. You want to play cricket. You play rugby. You play football. I mean real football, not this thing that is played in this country. They call it football and they play it with the iron masks and those kind of things. Real football. And we play it with feet. Um, and, 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 and the key word is play. Formula One, we play, we run with these cars, American uh, car racing, we play, this is the play, we just want to play. Why is this play so important? It's because the world is beset and visited by all types of conflicts, war, cross-border wars, international terrorism, these are the things that are plaguing sport. But they're not just plaguing, forget the sport, they're plaguing our opportunity to rest and to recreate after a long and hard day's work. 
after reproduction, after production, all we can do is to play. I just want to relax and be happy. But I still won't give me that chance. They want to throw bombs. Hamas wants to throw bombs. I say so because FIFA has asked me to lead the charge in finding peace and harmony between Israel and Palestine. I've just come back from Israel the other day, as well as Palestine, Ramallah. But Hamas says, come and visit us in Gaza. I will go to Gaza. I will sit down with, with Hamas because there's, got to, there's a need for the normalization of life in that part of the world, a bleeding part of the world. But the Israelis need protection themselves. And I asked some of the guys in the Defense Force in Israel, uh, these are jet fighter pilots. I'm a fighter pilot as well. But how do you fly and cause such a lot of damage? Uh, from the, they say these guys are digging tunnels under us. They just appear from nowhere and this is it. So I said, I think you need, this part of the world is bleeding. People need to sit down and do what we did in South Africa. I mean, I don't think I'll solve the, the equation there because it's been there for thousands of years. Camp Davids have been happening in this part of the world, in America, and they've never solved it. But we are what we are planning is to bring the Israelis and the Palestinians to Mandela Land, with both their teams, Mohammed, to begin to exploit the passport because people need to play. Away from the bombs and the tunnels and the air force and the cluster uh, strikes and drones and all these things, people just want to relax. People want to play. That's the biggest part of what mankind wants to do away from producing all types of goods and services. At the end of the day, we just want to relax. So, but this thing is faced with many, many more threats. There are all types of threats, terrorism, failed or failing states, social underdevelopment. Because if a country is underdeveloped, people are going to leave and it's, 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 it's going to affect their lives. It's going to affect their, their propensity to want to relax. It's going to affect their, their happiness, their joy, and their leisure. And that space is mostly occupied by sport. It is affected by corruption and graft, and I'll just come to that. Particularly as we have just seen, the biggest sport in the world, FIFA, has been affected by this. Um, I know here, at Securing Sport 2015, you have assembled a wonderful team of people, esteemed and impressive lineup of speakers. I also want to listen to them. Is Condi here? She's the biggest security person. That you, you need that security person because she was once national security advisor, I think, before she became Secretary of State. We want to hear what she's got to say about protecting not just the interests of Pentagon and the United States, but of something bigger than that, because the world is much more bigger than your country here. Uh, maybe I should say something about what happened to me. You know, whenever I come to the United States, uh, I get stopped at the customs. We get delayed. I get asked questions. Uh, I'm still classified as a terrorist in the, in the computers here, and I don't like it. So I say to these people, why do you keep us here? Why do you have, and they say, it's a computer, sir. But I said, we said to George Bush here and Condoleezza Rice to clear Mandela and our names out of the computers of your country where we're still classified as Bin Ladens. Do I look like a Bin Laden right now? <laughs> So we're trying to sort that out. So I hope uh, to see Condi and ask him, what happened? Because you said you have amended this piece of legislation. We judge Bush, not that. Um, but in any case, uh, let's find peace amongst friends. But let's do it the legal way. I'm saying she has been there uh, to, 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 to do a good job for the United States in a particular area. I'm glad she has been brought here so that we can get experience about protecting this bigger space where mankind sits down to, 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 to relax. I also want to, to hear what would be said by a number of people here. Sport has got to be protected also from pandem pandemics. My continent, Africa, something just came, Ebola. We didn't know where this thing came from. What kind of a disease is this? Did it come from with one of the vehicles from outer space? Is it something that went wrong with an experiment somewhere in some laboratory, which we don't understand? But what is good, and I must say, the United States of America always sends troops. Whenever there's a problem, these presidents here, the first thing they press is a bomb, bomb. We're bombing in five minutes, that type of. But this time, the USA sent out troops without guns, with medicines and kids to go and fight Ebola, to fight Ebola. But this also affects sports. We're able at FIFA to utilize a number of people like Ronaldo, Rooney, and so on, to go out as ambassadors 
to try to pacify the situation. These are threats. Hooliganism, anarchy, chaos, these things that we see. But I want to speak about something which is close to my heart. The biggest threat to sport. It made me go out of the way to establish an organization a few years ago called Global Watch. Uh, I'm the president of that organization. What is Global Watch? It is a call to action by all right-thinking persons across the world to, to take a stand against racial bigotry and other forms of discrimination. It is mindful that although this evil, racial bigotry, discrimination, although these things are a threat to the field of play, they don't emanate from the field of play. Racism is a societal ill that also needs to be combated beyond the field of play for the creation of a non-racial world. For me, that's the single largest thing that I, I see double S has got to look out for. I know there are all these things that you have lined up and I see the themes that we have here. But you don't, maybe you don't have to do that because Global Watch is there as your partner. Because our fight is where I've got expertise as a country and as a continent to fight racism on the field of play. I'll tell you why we chose this one. There will be answers, there will be ideas, there will be thoughts about how to deal with all sorts of threats to sport for insecurity. Threats coming from outside terrorism, the things that we can do. We hosted the World Cup in South Africa. We had all kinds of things, that, including jets, which were ready to scramble above the stadiums, just in case there were any threats. That's how big a World Cup can be. We sit with the Air Force and we plan everything. Joe Biden, your, your president, was in South Africa, and, and, and many other presidents, former President Clinton, and more than 100 leaders of the world were there just to secure that incident, that, 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 that function, the World Cup. We had to put everything in place. So it's easy to relatively to deal with these thre threats that are there on sports. It's easy to deal with uh, hooliganism. There's technology, even cyber security, of course, you know, one of the biggest things that we were concerned about during the World Cup 2010 in South Africa was the dropping of the signal, the broadcast signal. We had to broadcast that signal for 35 days, non-stop, without dropping it one moment, because the television, television screens of the world is affecting billions of people who have gone blank. The idea was to fight so that there's no hacking, there's no cyber attack. On this, on, on, in that area. So these things you can have, technology and so on, they need to be thought about and thought leaders here will tell, about, tell us about them. So externalities, things that can threaten sport and we can work out on mechanisms of how to counter these things. But this one, Mr. Chairman, racism, ask me, it's not external, it happens on the table tennis. It divides those players. It happens on the soccer pitch, it happens on the rugby pitch, on the football pitch, pitch, on the golf pitch, on the table, on the tennis court. It affects the Williams sisters. Tiger Woods feels it. It divides humanity. You cannot play sport. You can't defend in general. If this one is a problem, then there's no sport. So we established this organization, Global Watch. Uh, together with my own family foundation, Sahwale Foundation, Mandela Foundation, as well as the Doha Goals Forum. Those three partners, Global Watch. Like I said, it is a call, a call to arms for people to take note and to participate. What do we do at Global Watch? And I'll read a few things here. Global Watch is anchored in the principles enunciated in the universal Declaration of Human Rights, the International Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, and so on. The Global Watch, in particular, is inspired by the South African experience, which is the biggest in the world, of, of, of overcoming racism. 
in its legalized form, it was called apartheid. We arrived at a charter. The charter of, of, of Global Watch acknowledges the important role by, played by all sorts of individuals in the fight against racism and, and in taking a stand against racial discrimination in all spheres of human endeavor, particularly sport. And Global Watch recognizes the critical and positive role played by sport in the lives of people around the world. Like I said, in bringing joy, excitement, happiness, a strong sense of belonging and human solidarity. It also recognizes that like all social activity, sport is part of the larger society in which we all live. At Global Watch, we are concerned about the unsettling and rising trend of societal evils which are creeping upon sporting activities and are undermining our common humanity. These negatives take the form, amongst others, of racial bigotry, cultural divisions, gender discrimination, religious intolerance, ethnic strife, nationalistic hatred, xenophobia, and so on. When they hit the sporting field in the center of the pitch, you can defend ICSS on every other thing. If you don't stop this one, then there's no sport. Thus. When these things happen, racial bigotry, xenophobia, and so on, sporting participants are victimized and subjected to insults, abusive language, offensive slurs, inflammatory utterances during play, and in many cases, outright violence against some of the players, all aimed at breaking down the, their sporting spirit through their humiliation and denigration, the denigration of their human dignity. Furthermore, we at Global Watch note that these societal evils sometimes find encouragement, listen to this one, the division, the destruction of sport, sometimes finds encouragement from, se from se several quarters, including clubs or teams, in boardrooms of the teams, in boardrooms of companies, in federations, in confederations, confederations among sporting officials, amongst administrators, among sponsors. When a sponsor says, our sponsor, Rooney, but I won't sponsor Drogba. Amongst coaches, one German coach said that I will field this one because he's English, but I won't field the other one because he's Israeli. That's discrimination. Amongst fans who would even assault and humiliate their own fellow players. And sometimes it comes from owners of clubs. I know there's a Mr. Sterling here, the NBA who owned a, a club. He, he, he did something, naming people like Magic Johnson and so on, and he lost his club. The NBA, in the lexicon of Global Watch, is regarded as the number one key example where you have racial intolerance. Racism, the inter intolerance of racism, rather. The NBA is regarded as a leader in the world, above all sports, even above FIFA, in the work that we have done in showing zero tolerance to racism. Now, AMC Global Watch reminds us that racism, which once took the form of a party in my country, has been proclaimed it's a crime against humanity and is a threat to international peace. These are resolutions of the United Nations, uh, United Nations General Assembly as well as the Security Council. We are further reminded that various international mechanisms and fora have recommended that in all international sporting bodies should promote a world of sport free from racial discrimination, xenophobia, and so on. I can go on and on and on. The point is that at Global Watch, we identified racism and racial bigotry as the biggest threat to sport. There are other things you can deal with, but this one, if it's not addressed, then we've got a problem. I want to say, because I don't want to speak long, I come from far, and I've come to listen to other people as well, that we didn't just end here, there. In this part of the work, we say there should be solutions. Our solutions are to educate and to make people aware of this problem and to push forward the whole question of advocacy. And secondly, we, we, we do a lot of monitoring, analyzing, and prevention. But we push the buttons a bit more. There, there is a need for sanctions. 
I've said that in the, in the various sporting organizations where we are, particularly FIFA, there's a need for sanctions, for legal action, for clear criminal action to be taken. Because a lot of people get away, they destroy the whole spirit of sport, the whole stadium collapses, people lose out. Uh, they lose the taste of going to participate in sport because some people are doing strange things in the stadium. There's got to be criminal action because according to the laws of the world, international law, passed on not far from here, international uh, places such as the United Nations, racism is a crime. So it should not be tolerated. It's a crime. And it should be treated as a crime. But we've established what we call a barometer. It is going to start taking effect from next year. The barometer of Global Watch. Mohammed, what is this thing? We have set up a team of people. They are well resourced. Their job is to subject all the 205 countries, I don't know how many countries we have because they seem to be breaking up every day, these things. Subject each country to a litmus test of how that country responds to the question of racism in sport. For instance, America is going to be judged, so will Israel, so will South Africa, so will Palestine, and so on, on the basis of that barometer. We want to see how countries are responding. Because this barometer is going to be released once a year. We'd like to participate with yourselves so that you see the release of this barometer. With people like uh, Kofi Annan, I've got nine Nobel Prize winners which are working with us, Desmond Tutu, and so on. So, so that we can gauge countries and their participation and adherence to the barometer, to the code of conduct of Global Watch, to see how they are measuring up on the question of racism and discrimination in sport. Because if we don't stop that one there, then, uh, then we can kiss spot away. My last point is the following. A word on FIFA. Because failure to ad adhere to certain basic norms, values, standard ethics sees us having FIFA where it is today in the most unlikely place. And this is the world's number one and biggest sport. So what happened at FIFA? I don't really know. All I know is that the FBI are all over them. And when I came, I said, maybe the FBI is also looking for me here. But thanks God, it was something different. What is the immediate task at hand for FIFA? I think it's, it is to undo the crippling damage done to the FIFA brand globally by these scandalous allegations of corruption, of graft, of bribery and all this. The, the first task is to undo that. And that damage has been done affecting all stakeholders. The fans were children, the players, um, officials, administrators, the FIFA headquarters. I found well, it's got about 300 people there. A lot of people are beginning to shiver. They are sending their CVs around because they don't know what the future of this organization is going to be, which is under constant um, investigation. We don't know how long and how far, how deep this investigation is going. Yesterday, as I, as I got into the plane, they said, this thing may last for five years. So if, if I go into FIFA and I become president of FIFA, I don't want to be a president of an organization that is under investigation, away from me and the executive, uh, for five years, we, and we don't know what's... We appoint people and we're not sure where we're going. But we in FIFA brought ourselves to this position by failing to adhere to certain basic standards. It affects officials, sponsors, uh, stakeholders, the governments, the media, and the youth of the world who are the football food soldiers. FIFA is deeply affected. And this mammoth task of undoing the damage done to the brand of FIFA cannot be done by one person, one president. I hear this thing, find the new president of FIFA. That's not how you should go. There's no one man who's going to fix FIFA right now. It's a big organization, biggest in the world, occupies space in all countries. The United Nations about 100 and 80-something. FIFA is all countries of the world. So unto, unto, undo the damage will require the collective leadership 
wisdom, collective wisdom of a leadership collective, a leadership executive, a leadership which has been democratically elected in accordance with the new FIFA reforms. I know somebody is going to talk about these reforms here who comes from FIFA. FIFA's problems will be solved by a leadership equipped to tackle the issues of the 21st century. I'll tell you why I say this. Because FIFA is 111 years. It's 111 years old. And it's got to come up to live to the standards of what's happening in the 21st century. It's got to be equipped for that. Because things which are, were happening have left, have left um, a lot of us asking too many questions. The issues of the 21st century emphasizes very clear matters of international best practice, of good governance, good corporate governance, of accountability, of transparency, particularly in the decision-making processes and financial controls and management systems, um, with a clear understanding that there are checks and balances. So what failed in FIFA? Transparency. Transparency. And transparency again. At the end of the day, the associations of FIFA must know that they are in control. Before I part, a word of caution. A word of caution, a word of caution, a word of caution. Because it can also be a threat to a sport. Something which I coined yesterday as we talk about shareholder activism, when the shareholders are all over the company, to make sure, because the shareholders of the company, I should know I own companies. Must make sure that you know what your company is doing. Yeah, but if something happens and you didn't know, you better make sure that you act. I speak about sponsor, sponsors activism. It's welcome. Coca-Cola, Budweiser, these companies, partners of FIFA have got the right to speak. But I think we should be very careful how far we go with sponsors activism. And I want to talk on the last point about the unintended consequences of sponsor activism. So, they said, Mr. Blatter should go. Fine. Okay. And if he doesn't go, we pull out our money. Okay. What they did not mean and what they did not see is that in saying we'll pull out our money if he doesn't go, they are about to appoint the next FIFA president or the president of any organization that would be afflicted by similar problems. I know, I'm business. I want to follow my money. I want to know and understand if I'm sponsoring something, it goes to the project and I can see the projects on the ground. But I think the activism, activism of the sponsors should not have gone as far as saying if he doesn't go, we'll withdraw our money. Should have ended where Adidas said, we think that systems must be fixed up, get this thing working, blah, 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 blah. It's okay. But if you say, Mr. Blatter, if he doesn't go, we're well, withdrawing our money. Then, um, Mr. Sohali, if he doesn't suit them, he can't be elected. Before they knew it, the sponsors, and that's the unintended consequence of sponsor activism. The sponsors will be in a position to determine who gets into the NBA and who doesn't get there. I don't think they were intending that. So one of the things that needs to be done in giving confidence and building back the brand of FIFA is to sit down with the sponsors and say, you know, you have got a word. There's a way of doing these things without you saying so and so should go. Maybe they wanted Mr. Blatter to go fine. But to put it in the manner that they put, uh, it means you are now going to determine who runs Formula One, who runs the NBA, who runs FIFA, because if you say it's my money, if you are, I don't like you, you go. Uh, I think that was taking it a bit far. It's understandable, it's acceptable, it's applaudable that the sponsors must be activists. They must express concern, it is their money. But I think they should have done it the Adidas way. Express yourself, but don't threaten to pull out money. Because if you do that, you are virtually expelling a president and you are appointing the next one. Or you are refusing to appoint or to recognize one that would have been uh, elected democratically, but you may not like. I thought I should say that, but that's a threat to the sport as well. You may want to look at that as I see double S. So it's a job to do. I'm here to listen to other people, be tired from flying, 
But thank you for inviting me. Thank you for listening. Yeah. Thank you.